the Viewing Stone Association of North America. It's an online educational project with the goal of informing people about the ancient Asian art of stone appreciation using books, articles, lectures, website, and online seminars such as this one. Today, the focus of the, of the program will be on Chinese and Japanese traditions of enhancing stones, both ancient and modern. And I will be leading the program today and we will be looking at a variety of stones. Almost all of the ones you see have been enhanced and I'll talk about them. They were all taken by me. And just as a reminder, viewing stones are natural or natural appearing stones that are appreciated for their aesthetic quality and for the feelings that they invoke. Now, improving the appearance of stone is an ancient tradition that has been continued to the present uh, for several thousand years. Enhancing the stone is one of the most controversial aspects of stone appreciation. And I'll get into the reasons for that uh, as, we get, as we move through the program. But I feel that it's important for people to learn about stone enhancement as an important step to becoming a viewing stone connoisseur. Now it's important to remember that not all stones are enhanced. And there are people that prefer to collect and display only natural stones. That's fine. I'm not going to advocate for enhanced stones or against enhanced stones today. My goal is simply inform you about, about them and what has happened over the past hundreds of years. Also, I've discovered that most new stone collectors do not have a sufficient background or experience to be able to distinguish between a natural stone and stones that have been enhanced by a professional. So why do people enhance stones? First important question. The obvious answer is to improve their appearance, to make them look more attractive because many people believe that they have a superiority over nature that allows them to alter nature to fit our desires, to improve on nature. Another reason is to improve their balance or display. You, if you have a nice stone and you wanna bring it indoors and display it, and it's got a big knob on the bottom or not flat, people alter it so it will sit or in like. But there's a third important aspect of this and that's profit. People made stones, altered stones, to create a product that people wanted and were willing to buy. And it was developed into a fairly lucrative business in both China and Japan in the past. In the early Chinese literature, such as this Yun Lin Shi Pu, it was published 900 years ago. And it's the first book to list and describe stones that were collected solely for their aesthetic qualities in China. No illustrations. But it also described how stones were enhanced or altered back 900 years ago. Then as we fast forward, we can look at the Japanese books, Japanese literature from the 1960s through the 1980s, 1990s. And many of these books described in detail how Japanese stones or suiseki were altered. So individuals that had an in-depth knowledge of suiseki was aware of the thriving business of making and selling enhanced stones. But somehow the publications that began to appear in English and German other languages languages other than Japanese, mistakenly were led to believe that all Japanese stones were naturally occurring. And that what you were seeing in, in the exhibitions 
were stones that looked exactly as they were brought out of the water or from the earth. And that's not the case. Now, these earlier contributions, especially by Crivello and Yoshimura, were very important. It helped many people learn about Japanese stone appreciation. And the same with Willie Bentz, his, his book, and other authors. I don't believe there was any intent to mislead people. I believe that they heard this and believed it and wrote it. And it's been my experience with stone dealers, both in China and Japan, is that they maintain a don't ask, don't tell approach to, to customers. That is, if you don't ask them if the stone has been modified, they won't tell you, even if they know. But if, you, if they do know, honest uh, dealers will tell you and inform you of that. Now, what is an enhancement? I define it for this purpose of this seminar as any deliberate man-made intervention to a stone, usually done in the belief that it improves the appearance. Now, newly collected stones from rivers and streams may have algae on them or moss or mollusk. Uh, stones that come out of the earth usually have a very fine coating uh, of other material on them. And some stones that occur in dry areas will have lichens on them, as in this picture. Now, stones that have been cleaned to remove this material is usually not considered as altering the stone. It's just cleaning it so to expose the features of the stone. But some stones that are removed from the earth, as I said, has a very hard, crusty surface over them and it requires more aggressive techniques. But before I go into that, I'd like to just throw out something for, your, for you to think about. Lichens are a naturally occurring phenomenon in nature. The lichen attaches itself to the stone chemically. And is there ever a time or opportunity to display a stone with naturally occurring lichens on them? We won't answer that question today. It's just for you to think about. Well, let's look at aggressive cleaning, what that means and what type of stones are subject to that. Three of the most popular viewing stones and suiseki in the world require aggressive cleaning techniques using power tools and wire brushes. On the left, you can see that small Lingbi stone from uh, China. Eastern China. On the left is a Ligurian stone from the mountains in Northwestern Italy. And in the center is a Faria stone from Wakayama, Japan, a couple hours train ride south from Tokyo. All three of these stones, when they come out of the earth, will look something like the stone on the right. This is a stone that I collected in Liguria. And just as I dug it out of a rocky bank and it's covered with this fine light colored material. You can't just brush it off or wash it off. It requires power tools to remove it. And once you remove that outer layer, you can expose the Palombino limestone as you see on, on the stone on the left. So this aggressive cleaning using power tools is an enhancement because you're trying to bring out, expose the features of the stone. Mm -hmm. Now, enhancements come in many forms. One is simply the addition of oils or waxes to the surface to darken it or to make it a little more shiny or for the colors to stand out. Uh, also people expose, bring stones out of the streams and earth clean them, and then put them out in the rain or water them uh, periodically so it will slowly develop a patina, a surface feature that makes the stone look older. But even this is a form of enhancement. Also, some people have taken pigments or colors and added them to the stone, enhanced them to make it look more attractive. 
a more aggressive form of enhancement is using grinding tools, carving, sandblasting, and modifying the shape or form of the stone. Also, people have used, still use various acid treatments to create a texture. This may be a form of dipping the stone for a few minutes in hydro, dilute hydrochloric acid or muriatic acid. If it's a limestone based stone, the muriatic acid will dissolve it slowly and etch it. This is used in, in uh, swimming pools. Or they take stone and completely carve it uh, to make a viewing stone, to make it look like a mountain range or a figure or whatever. It's still natural stone, but it's completely carved. You could even call it a sculpture that looks like natural stone. Now, the enhancement of stones has been going on for thousands of years. If you look back at the Neolithic period, from 10,000 to 4,500 uh, before the Common Era, that's about 6,000 years ago, people were taking small stones and small minerals and scraping them and polishing them such as this perforated disc or by from China. And this was made primarily of jade. Jade was one of the first uh, stones that was widely used in, for ornamentation and for its aesthetic qualities when it was polished. So this process enhancement is truly ancient. Now, let's look at a stone shop in Lingbi City we visited several years ago. And go, I want to refer you to a reference Professor Edward Schaefer wrote uh, in a book, Two Wan Stone Catalog. He translated that earliest catalog on viewing stones in China. And he said, it's almost always necessary to clean the specimen. Some kinds can be washed out with ease, as our author points out. Others have to be severely brushed to remove the clay or earth from the surface and crevices. The stones of Ling Pi, for instance, were scraped with iron blades and then brushed with a broom of bamboo dipped in magnetite particles. Now, Ling Pi is an early Chinese name for Ling Bi stones. And they not only scraped and or cleaned them as they're doing in this picture, the fellow on the right has sandpaper, the fellow on the left has a wire brush but they would then use the magnetite to give a sheen or polish to them after it was cleaned. Professor Schaefer went on, Professor Schaefer was at the University of California, Berkeley, and one of the finest Chinese scholars in the US. And he also translated and, and wrote, even a garden stone was rarely ready for use in its raw condition. 12th century connoisseurs seem not to have placed a premium on natural stones. The stone catalog tells us repeatedly that the artistry of the specimen must be enhanced by human hands and metal tools. At a minimum, pieces must be cut level at the bottom to give them stability when set or on a tabaret. And that is a low stool or small table, which could be even be indoors. And Professor Schaefer also wrote that although specimen rocks need shaping and polishing, it was preferred that the rocks look old as well. If these pro properties were not mutually exclusive, an apparent unique process reserved for the stones of the Grand Lake. After specimens of this highly honored rock had been cut to properly handsome proportions, they were once again immersed in the lake where they remain long enough to give an aged appearance to the surface. Now, stones of Grand Lake referred to Taihu stones. A Tai Lake was uh, northwest, a little northwest of Shanghai um, with Wuxi on the eastern border. So it's referring here to Taihu stones. They were taken out of the lake, worked, put back into the lake for maybe several years 
because the water action would then slowly erase any signs of working. Now let's go from the hundreds of years ago to the present. Today, there are several centers in China that are manufacturing stones that are on the, on the market. One of the places in Guangxi province in southwestern China, near the city of Liuzhou, and there's extensive limestone deposits there. And limestone and calcium carbonate stones are very easy to work. And they can be carved and, and, and modified. Here you see one of low or medium quality. If you look at the detail on this, uh, you can see that it hasn't been finished quite as well as the stone on the right. Every detail of the stone on the right has been hand, carefully handcrafted. And so you find a range from low quality, inexpensive stones to high quality. And I've been in markets in uh, the Shanghai region where the stone dealer is unpacking boxes uh, that contain dozens of these stones. So these types of stones are manufactured into hundreds, if not thousands, and distributed to dealers across China and sometimes exported. When I first got the stone on the right, I was told it came from a high mountain stream in Guangxi province. But I knew later that that wasn't really true because if it came from a stream with the water flowing over it, the gravel and the sand, it, it would, wouldn't have those short pointed peaks on it. It would be all rounded off. Now let's go to Ling B stones. We've spent time with uh, two different occasions with one of the leading stone carvers in China. And he would buy large blocks of limestone, marine limestone from, from Ling B County in Anhui province. And these blocks would be four to six inches wide. Or thick. He would then take a drill and carve out drill holes and make a rough outline of a, of a stone that he wanted. And you, he would then lay it down and drill holes in. And what he's doing is beginning to form the peaks of his viewing stone. I don't get that. Now, he, they use a variety of tools for this. The, the tool in the upper left is for grinding and, and further refine shaping of the stone. Then they'll take smaller tools, such as the, in the upper right, you'll see a little uh, thin uh, implement that fits into a power tool and they can carve ridges throughout the stone. Or they can take the tool on the lower part, which is a a little chisel, power chisel, and form other little depressions in the stone. And what they end up with after several hours of work or a day or two of work are stones that look like this. They're nearly completed uh, Ling B stones because they, that the stone came from Ling B and they're composed of marine limestone. These stones are about from 12 to 18 inches wide. Then the third stage after they do that is darkening and antiquing the stones using proprietary techniques. And this is something that I was keenly interested in. We had talked with three different people who were carving and dyeing, antiquing stones for the commercial market. And many of these stones were being exported abroad. And they told me some of the techniques they use, but they never told me the complete formula that they use. So I came home and I took a stone, a light gray ying stone, and tried to repeat the process. And now you're going to see what happened. This is what happens to a stone over 24 hours when uh, it's first soaked in a solution of concentrated black tea, lime, and then later a little bit of ink, black ink was added to it. And I would heat this up 
put the stone in a pan with this solution, heat it, let it cool. I did this 10 times. And you, what you can see is the progression from the light gray, it keeps getting darker with each treatment. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the final treatment yet. I don't know how they make that nice antique look on it, but I'll continue working on this until I can master it. So here's the same stone after uh, 48 hours and 10 treatments. So it is possible to darken stones using uh, various solutions. Now, an easier way to do this, but it's also more obvious, is to take a concentrated solution of potassium permanganate. And it, potassium permanganate is a strong oxidizing agent. It will interact with the surface of the stone and penetrate it somewhat. Now, the stone on your left is a very large boulder. And it, it was started out the same color as the boulder in the upper right-hand corner behind the fellow standing there. And they use this to paint uh, a stone. I've done this with small uh, light gray limestone pieces and it will have a slightly purplish cast to it. And the patina on this is kind of dull. So I can, it's possible to pick this out, stones that have been treated with potassium permanganate. Now other stones, such as the Chinese chrysanthemum flower stones <clears throat> are beautiful. These stones, the white petal-like, flower-like formations are natural. This is usually calcite or some form of calcite. And it formed 250 million years ago in a shallow seabed. It was uplifted, moved over, and they're embedded in uh, limestone and occurs as very large plates or blocks these are dug up, then they cut around them to isolate the, where the mineral formations are and shape the stone. They sometimes will darken the matrix if it's too light using black, but these are, the mineral formations are natural. It's a natural limestone, but it's been enhanced to set out, set aside the uh, flower-like patterns. And so, it's a beautiful stone. And if you saw it before it was enhanced, you probably would not see three fourths or most of those flower like petals. So what we are talking about is creating a stone that speaks to you, that creates an impression that suggests something greater than the stone itself. And this is, this is the important aspect that I'm trying to uh, make today. Another type of Chinese stone that you'll see in the market are Taihu stones. They, tai, Taihu refers to Tai Lake, a large circular lake near Wuxi, northwest of Shanghai. <clears throat> and the stone that's like at one time had many beautiful stone formations in it. And back quite early in the Ming and pre-Ming dynasty, they broke them off, took these stones, and worked them and then took them to courtyards and sold them to bureaucrats and wealthy merchants to display. And by the late being, most of the Taihu stones in Lake Tai were gone. So now when you see a stone called Taihu, it could be from almost anywhere in Southern Southwestern China. There's Northern Taihu, Southern Taihu. So it's become a generic term for, for light colored limestone with holes. The stone on the right has had several holes drilled. It's been shaped and then sandblasted. So it's as smooth as can be when you, when you look at this stone. The stone on your left is a natural Taihu stone, one that hasn't been altered. And it has a slightly rough texture uh, to it, uneven. And so the natural Taihu stones are rare uh, today. You, most people have not seen a completely natural Taihu stone. Now, when we went to, we've been to many stone exhibitions and stone festivals throughout China. Uh, this is one exhibition we were at near Shanghai. And the fellow in the photograph 
has applied a soft paste wax to the stone. He's then ta taking a propane tank and torch and he's heating that wax. The heating process darkens the wax and it also causes the stone to expand. Um, and then he lets it cool. And what happens as it cools, it soaks in that darkish brownish wax. So he has waxed this stone, heated it probably several times and permanently altered the color of the stone. I've seen this process occurring many times in China. In the lower left, another vendor had bottles of mineral oil for sale, 30 yuan or about $5 per bottle. And they would take the mineral and put them on uh, stones, especially light colored stones, limestones, porous stones to darken them. They did this because people felt that a dark stone was represented an older stone and uh, more of a closer to being an antique. And so there was demand for dark colored stones. As soon as there's a customer demand, there will be people there to supply them, taking stones and altering the color to make it dark. Now here is a wonderful man-made stone, uh, Ling B stone. And it's a large stone, about 50 centimeters, about two feet wide. And stones like this are being sold in uh, major auction houses in Shanghai and elsewhere. And they call them Ling B stones, which is true, uh, but they don't say that they're antique. This stone was patterned after an illustration in the Shu Yuan Shi Pu a book that was published about 400 years ago. And in volume two of that book, near the second page, you can see this stone, illustration of this stone. And the fellow that made this stone uh, used that illustration when he manufactured this. Now, one of the leading Chinese scholars in England is Marcus Flax. He's also a specialist on antique furniture and stones. And Marcus wrote, one of the greatest misconceptions in modern times about collecting rocks is that their value is based on them being untouched and natural objects. One of the most alluring aspects of scholar rocks is the symbolic artistry of nature and man and the Chinese reverence for stones. So they made no attempt in China to mask the fact that they were altering stones. They wrote about it. Uh, and so it's not a an attempt to misinform people. It's just that many people from North America and Europe cannot read the Chinese literature or the Japanese literature. And so they miss this important aspect. Now we're going to switch from China to Japan. Now, the documented accounts of enhancements in Japanese suiseki are more recent, uh, only in the last 120 years that we found. There may be early accounts, but we haven't seen them yet. And I'm only referring to documents and literature that we have seen and have. Um, I'm not using any secondhand information in this presentation. The stone in the lower left is from the Seta River. It's a Santa River tiger stripe stone that has been carved, both the top and bottom part. It's been in, a, in, a, in an exhibit, in a major exhibit in Japan many years ago. The stone on the right is a beautiful Nao Valley chrysanthemum flower stone, but it didn't look like this. It was pulled out of the mountain. There was a matrix of stone, black stone over this, and it had to be cut and carved and removed to expose the uh, natural mineral formations here, the flower-like formations. Now in Japan, the Saikai family, father and son, were collecting stones in the Ibi River back in the late 1890s. And they began to carve them. Uh, so they were stone carvers and worked them. And they started selling them 
at that time. They opened up a shop in Gifu in 1907. And then his son opened another stone shop, Gai, Gai Zeki Inn, in Tokyo in 1924 to sell altered E.B. River stones. These were some of the first earliest stone carvers that uh, we're aware of in modern times in Japan. Now, at first, they would take larger stones and simply cut them, cut a piece off. They would look at the stone and see, oh, if I could remove this part, it would make a nice landscape stone. Because people felt they wanted landscape stones, but you couldn't find enough nice ones in nature. So they would cut stones to make a flat level bottom. It was also easier to put in a wood base like this. So this set of river stone is 54 inches wide. It's a fairly Gee. large stone. It was exhibited in the Taikan Tin in Kyoto in 1987. And then it was exhibited in the World Bonsai Convention in 2005, where it won an award for the best mountain stone in the exhibition. So when you're looking at this, you don't see the bottom cut. You just see the, the natural part of the stone, the upper part, and you can easily, the stone easily suggests a mountain range, a distant mountain range to you. It's a beautiful stone. Now, another book by Inoue, How to Appreciate and Take Care of Suiseki, illustrates graphically how to alter stones. And then it has an appendix and a detail count how to polish them. And then appendix three is a chart listing 29 different Japanese stone types and the methods used to modify them. So this was not just a, a rare incident. It was taking place fairly common, widespread. And there's another book, Modern Suiseki Photo Book, published in 1963 by Murata Kenji. And in the appendix, he lists the names and addresses of nine professional stone carvers. Most were in Gifu. Well, what was going on in Japan in the 1960s? This was at, at the time when there was a boom of, of interest in stones in Suiseki and collecting them. And the Murata family published about 20 books or more, edited or authored. 20 books, popularized books on popularizing stones. And stone collecting in Japan went from a small group of mainly literati to after the war, after the recovery from the Second World War, people were pursuing tra traditional arts and crafts and stone appreciation, collecting and appreciating stones were being widely promoted. People became interested in it and the numbers exploded. There have been estimates of several hundred thousand people. One person told me that as many as two million people in Japan were collecting stones in the 1960s and 70s. I think that might be an exaggeration, but there certainly were lots of people, hundreds of clubs, and there was a shortage of really quality landscape stones. People were wanting them. So what happened was people started stepping in and uh, making stones for the consumers. Now, people like the Maratas endorsed enhancements. KG, the son, said, my approach is to come up with ways to provide assistance and modifications in order to reveal the interest and the beauty of stones. And in the 1970s, well, we can see that early in the early 1900s, there are just a few stone carvers that are known, can be documented. By the 1960s, 70s, 80s, there were as many as 20 professional stone carvers producing suiseki in Japan, Japanese stones. And since the 1990s, there's been a slowly, slow decline in the numbers. What happened in 1991, the economic bubble collapsed. 
prior to this in the 1980s, there was a greatly inflated values in real estate and the stock markets. And in 1990, it all collapsed and a lot of people were lost their jobs the, and no longer had the kind of money available to spend on discretionary items such as stones. And so the number of people actively involved in collecting displaying stones began to decline and shrink. And it's gone from several hundred thousand down today to perhaps 2,000 people involved in various aspects of stone clubs in uh, Japan. Well, we're going to look at a stone carver that was working in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. He's still uh, alive today. He's, he's a good friend of ours. We visited him several times in his shop and he spent a great deal of time giving me information about how he makes stones. This is Mr. Sakurai. He's a, probably one of the finest stone carvers to ever live in Japan. And here's an example of a stone where he's beginning, he's making rough cuts with it, with his, with his saw to get the rough shape of the stone. From that point on, he takes hand tools and works with, if it's a small stone, he'll use a cold chisel and a hammer to remove parts of the stone and shaping it. Uh, the low, lower left is a power grinder, so he can grind off parts, round stones off, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner. The upper right are two uh, stones for grinding and shaping the stone. And then in the lower right, it's a very interesting little pneumatic chisel. He plugs us into a compressor and the little tip of that goes back and forth and you can slowly chip away pieces of rock and shape it. And you can see here, he's been working on this stone. Now he also uses this large saw, circular saw for major cutting. And then the instrument on the right is sandblasting equipment. There on, you can see a box with a plastic front he places a stone inside of that box to be sandblasted. And then the round cylinder, large cylinder to the left holds the grit. And he has an air compressor and he blows this through the tube. You can see where he can stick his hand in there. And then he can sandblast the stones. Now, if you removed a stone from the river and it's dull and has stuff on it, you can put it there. And in a few minutes, you can completely sandblast, clean it and give it a nice polish to it. Something that mm -hmm. would take, take you uh, hours by hand. And there are different nozzles for the tube. One to have it very concentrated to actually remove it. And the others is more broader just to develop a texture. So he was showing us how he uses this and how he can work with stones. Now, Mr. Sakurai only worked with four or five different types of stones because he knew how to cut them, how they would chip, how they would break. Now, here are landscape stones in various stages of progression. The one on the right, upper right would have a plateau with a mountain in the back. The one on the uh, left, you see the blue arrow sticking up. That indicates where the bottom of this mountain stone will be. He will cut that, not straight across, but a little bit of an angle and remove that bottom third of the stone. And then he'll eventually end up with a stone like you see in the lower right that has not final shape to it and then been treated to darken it. Now here are some completely manufactured landscape stones. Upper left, you see a stone. It was originally a two-tone stone where you had a white rock and a black rock that was fused together. He removes most of the white rock and shapes it so it would look like Mount Fuji, the revered mountain in Japan. So any stone like this that was manufactured would sell readily in a, in a stone market. The stone on the lower left has also been manufactured. When I bought this stone, I was told that it's natural, but only a little modified a little bit on the bottom. Why well, I learned later from other uh, experts in Japan that that wasn't the case. It's been 
completely modified. Now, Mr. Sakurai can produce six to eight landscape stones in a day. Wow. And please mute your, your speaker, please. And he could make up to 35 or 40 work stones per month or roughly 2,000 a year. And he's produced them for 40 years. So you can see that over a 20 year period from 1960 to 1990, roughly a half a million to a quarter of a million to three quarters of a million stones were made. And these went into the market. They were sold to dealers who then sold them to collectors. And the provenance or history of them was lost as the stones moved from one owner to another. So even though people believe their stone was natural, because it was worked so beautifully, uh, it wasn't. I remember we were sitting and he pulled a book off the shelf of a, a recent publication and it showed beautiful stones and he opened it up and this stone was described as natural, but he said, I made this. And he told me the year he made it. We looked at another one, I made this stone. And so Mr. Sakurai estimated that about 60% of the landscape stones in Japan were in 1960s were manufactured or enhanced. Now he estimates that about 40% of the landscape stones are enhanced. Why has it gone down? Well, the number of collectors in Japan has dropped in the last two decades to, and the demand for them is not there. During the peak, Mr. Sakurai could would be, have people lined up at his shop to clean stones or to do work on them. That doesn't happen anymore. They would also take stones. There were two major treatments on stones, finished stones. One was using a liquid wax, kintoku, and they would, it's a wax that was used for interior wood surfaces, and they would put it on the, rub it on the stone. The other, they would take a soft pliant wax from an insect, the Ibota insect, put it in a cheese cloth and squeeze it, and then rub that cloth on the stone surface of it. That would deposit a very thin, dry uh, layer of wax on it. But they didn't sell the stone at that point. They would put it out on outside on tables in exposed to the air and rain and snow. Now, in Japan, most of us know this as yoseki, or cultivating stones, where you put stones out on a table and you water them with a hose and let the rain. And over many months or a couple of years, they develop a patina. It's an oxidation process with the surface of the stone. And this is recommended for people, uh, collectors, that you do this. Well. The yoseki was also used by the stone carvers as a way to mask the marks made in the manufacturing process. They would slowly disappear through the oxidation process. And Mr. Sakurai would keep stones like this for a year, two, or even three years uh, as they were undergoing this slow, gradual modification. Now let's look at uh, Japanese hut stones. Now, the stone in the upper left was the first Japanese stone I ever owned. I bought it at a bonsai meeting in Tokyo. I was very proud of it, and I couldn't believe it was natural. I told someone it was natural, and they laughed and said, no, this has been manufactured. Well, I learned that Mr. Sakurai was a primary producer of hut stones in Japan. He could make one in 10 or 15 minutes uh, on his lap with a carver. All of these stones have been cut or created uh, by uh, professional stone carvers. Now, here are four naturally occurring hot stones that have not been modified. You see, they don't have that nice uniform shape and you have to learn how to position and hold them in order to get this shape. The stone in the lower right, if I took it out of the base and handed it to you, you would look at it and say, no, this isn't worth keeping. It's not until you know how to look at it and orient it, does it make a naturally occurring stones. 
So I estimate that somewhere between 10 and 20% of the hot stones in Japan are natural. All the remainder are, have been worked to some degree. Now you can even do this. If you go to the Ibi River, Ibi River in Japan or any other river, walk along and look for stones, two-tone stones like this, where you have a white rock fused with dark rock. You can easily take the rock on your left, take a diamond drill and start removing the white part all around it and create a hut shaped uh, stone. Now, let's continue on looking at modified stones. In the early 1920s, 1930s, there was a stone collector by the name of Yojuro. And he collected uh, the two-tone stones as you see in the lower right hand side. This has been shaped somewhat. And he would take them, uh, he didn't carve them, but he sold them to uh, other collectors, or any other stone carvers in uh, Gifu, who would then carve them and make beautiful mountain scenes, distant mountain scenes with a plateau in front. Here are two beautiful Yojiro stones from the 1930s. These are collector's items. You can see them displayed in major exhibits at the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum or at the Mayan Ten at the Meiji Shrine or in Kyoto. And uh, every major stone exhibit I visited in Japan will have were enhanced stones, either bottom carved or modified like this to some degree, but not all of them. Now let's look at the Japanese chrysanthemum flower stones. You see a picture in the upper right hand corner, perhaps three fourths of all the Japanese flower stone, chrysanthemum flower stones have been poly cut and polished. Why is that so? Look in the upper left hand corner. You see a, a stone that has been removed from the mountains. You don't see those flower patterns. You have to cut the stone, chip away to expose those mineral deposits and then polish it. So three fourths of the stones are like this. There are natural occurring chrysanthemum flower stones, but the appearance is totally different from these. So you would not have these stones. You wouldn't have many chrysanthemum flower stones if it wasn't for enhancements like this. Now, another type of stone in Japan that is often seen is from Saddle Island, just off the coast from west coast from Niigata. And they have, they used to have vast deposits of red chert or they also called Akadama. These stones, if you look at the upper right, are kind of blocky and irregular shaped. But the Saddle Island Akadama stones that you see in the stone markets tend to look like the ones in the lower left. Nice mountain shaped stones. Well, you can take this stone and a cold chisel and slowly chip away and shape the stone. It's not that difficult to do. So most of the Saddle Island stones that I've seen in the market have been enhanced or greatly uh, by stone carvers. It's rare to find a naturally occurring one. Now, even rubbing a stone with your hand or with a cloth is another form of enhancement because you're deliberately trying to modify the appearance of the surface. And you take the oil in your hand and as you rub it, that oil gets on the stone. Some of my friends will wait till the summer when it's a hot, sweaty day and take the sweat off their, off their brow and rub it and trying to do it. And this slowly darkens the stone. It's not a major adjust, uh, alteration. It's just, you're just trying to improve the appearance of the stone and make it more attractive, make it more acceptable. Now, another type of stone in Japan that is sometimes altered are the waterfall stones. And some of these come from the Ibi River. This one is the Puriya waterfall stone. The Faria stones come from Wakayama, Japan, and they're removed from the mountains. They're removed from the earth 
and they'll have that white powdery stuff over them that you have to remove using brushes. But sometimes the waterfall is not very distinct. And this particular stone, somebody has taken white paint and very carefully painted, added, embellished the waterfall to make it more realistic looking. Sometimes they'll scrape it with a needle to give it a little bit of depth. And so you have to look at this carefully. If you take a magnifying glass and look at a waterfall stone, you can sometimes see the uh, crystal formations because calcite and quartz are, will have crystals formations to them. And you can see those. Or you can take a high resolution picture of it and blow it up and eventually see the crystals. But you won't find these a little bit of white going over the stone. That's not uh, uh, calcite or quartz crystals. That's been that's paint. Now this is two pattern stones. They're small stones. The one on the left is completely natural, and it's some. It's been called a plum flower stone because you can see the suggestion of a trunk and branch coming off of it. And then the white specks are naturally occurring in that rock and are suggest flowers. The one on the right, the beige colored or tan colored stone also is all the spots on it are natural. And then on the branch, only the upper a part of it on the left, upper left part is natural. The middle part and lower part and the branch coming up forking is a light brown or tan paint. Somebody's very carefully painted that connecting pieces to make the branch. So about 60% of that branch is painted where the blue arrow is. Now I did an experiment two years ago I posted both of these stones on my Facebook page and wanted to see how people responded to them. Two out of three people preferred or like the altered or enhanced stone. Why? Because it's more explicit. They could understand it more quickly than they could the stone on the left. The stone on the left is more suggestive and you have to be able to look at it and interpret it to and see what it comes what comes into your mind. The stone on the right, it's obvious it's a branch and the flower petals. The cherry blossom petals are flowing off into the uh, breeze. Well, in North America and Europe, uh, the enhancing stones exist. It continued in North America and I believe in Europe, although I don't have as much data to support it. I know that in Northern California, it was common to cut stones to make a flat base so it could be uh, displayed readily. Uh, stones were treated with outside exposed to the air. And it's important to note that you can't put all stones outside because if you put the Oh, the Gurian stones and the Faria stones outside, they will just start turning white, lighten. Especially if your water has hard minerals in it, you'll get calcium deposits on them. I've also seen in North America where stones were treated, acid treated, dipped in hydrochloric acid to darken them. Certain stones will do that, or dipped in muric acid. And it's fairly common for stones to be oiled or waxed using uh, natural waxes and natural oils or mineral oil. Now, actually carving stones and shaping stones is rarely done in Western countries that I know of. <clears throat> the reason for that is there's not a demand. There's not a sufficient demand of people not willing to pay uh, for stones like this. And so the market's not there. And so people are not doing it. Some people say that oiling a stone is not really an enhancement because the oil will evaporate. Well, I question that because I don't see any evidence for that, especially if you keep the stone inside or indoors. I have some oiled stones that were darkened after the oil was applied and they're still dark years later. 
it doesn't always <clears throat> evaporate. So the important thing here is, does the stone speak to you? Does it suggest something greater than the stone itself? Does it invoke feelings? This is more important than this has, if the stone's been enhanced in the past at some time. If 40 years ago, did somebody put oil on this? Well, if so, I'm gonna throw it away, it's no good. I don't accept that. I look at this stone and I say, wow, this is impressive mountain range. I can enjoy this stone. It speaks to me. So don't let the possibility that a stone been enhanced interfere with your practice of stone appreciation. Viewing stones are natural or natural appearing stones that are collected, displayed, and appreciated for their aesthetic qualities and for the feelings they invoke. So for more information about stone enhancements, I encourage you to go to my website, www.tisana.org. There are four articles there, two on the Chinese tradition of enhancing the stone that are in the feature article, and the two articles on earlier articles on Japanese stones, modifying them, are found in the classroom where the articles have been uh, reproduced. <clears throat> 